This is BBC One, now at six o'clock, the BBC News with Fiona Bruce. Turmoil in Egypt, thousands gather in protest as the crisis there deepens. This is a scene live in Cairo's Tahrir Square, the third day in a row that people have come out to demand the president's resignation. Mohamed Morsi and his government are in emergency talks, but there's no sign of a breakthrough. And there are now just 24 hours to go until the army's deadline expires when it has threatened to impose its own solution on Egypt. Also tonight, Wales is set to agree a law that will presume organs should be donated after death unless people have specifically refused. The government questions the use of stop and search when less than 10% result in an arrest. She got it. And Sabine Lisicki is through to the Wimbledon semi-finals. She'll face the number four seed, Aniska Radvanska. On BBC London, the government's criticised over a grant to set up the UK's first free state boarding school and the billion-pound transformation of an area in South London. But will new jobs go to Londoners? Good evening and welcome to BBC News at six. Egypt's political crisis has deepened with more mass demonstrations by opponents and supporters of the president, Mohamed Morsi. He's held talks with senior ministers after a wave of resignations from his government as a deadline imposed by the military to resolve the crisis fast approaches. If he fails to reach a deal by this time tomorrow night, the army says it will impose its own solution. James Robbins reports. <laughs> Divided Egypt is heading towards a showdown. These protesters proclaim their loyalty to the nation, but not its president. They say Mohamed Morsi must quit a year after his narrow victory in free elections. They accuse him of exceeding his powers, trying to impose an Islamic state. All the ministers in President Morsi's government should resign, this man says pull out from this government. Nobody's forcing them to stay in the government. We're looking for them to go, and after that, Morsi will be alone. But the president is not alone on the streets. These are some of his supporters at their own counter-demonstrations, and they're vowing to resist what they see as an attempt to overthrow democracy. We fear the revolution we carried out is going to be stolen from us, this man says. That would be a liberal, secular coup against the Egyptian revolution. Alarmed by all of this, yesterday Egypt's military threatened action, warning political leaders to make peace within 48 hours or risk the army stepping in. The turmoil in Egypt is all about one man. Mohamed Morsi, elected president a year ago, but by a narrow majority, now accused by the minority of ignoring them and governing only for his side. His supporters insist he has a mandate and opponents are using violence to overthrow democracy. The army, always crucial kingmakers in modern Egypt, now threaten unspecified intervention if civilian leaders fail to achieve reconciliation. It's a potent threat because the military have acted before and they see themselves as guardians of a stable Egypt in which they intend to safeguard both their power and huge economic interests. <laughs> President Obama, completing his African tour in Tanzania, has telephoned Egypt's embattled leader. Mr Obama urged him to resolve the crisis through a political process. With round-the-clock protests now, President Morsi is under intense pressure to quit or at least to bend. To find some middle ground to share with his opponents and persuade them to go home. James Robbins, BBC News. Well, our Middle East editor Jeremy Bowen joins us live now from Tahrir Square. Uh, Jeremy, the army's deadline is tomorrow. If the politicians fail to reach an agreement that satisfies the crowds behind you there, what is likely to happen? Well, feelings are running high on every side here. Well, behind me, a lot of um, anti Morsi people. I've just been, though, to a big pro Morsi rally organised by the Muslim Brotherhood. Just after I left on my way here, there was a shooting there. Feelings again, a lot of anger burst right out. 
Uh, Egypt tonight is very tense. Nobody knows, except perhaps the commander of the army, which way things are going to go tomorrow when the army ultimatum, their 48 hour deadline to the two groups here to sit down and sort things out expires. There is a report tonight from the Reuters news agency, which they tag as an exclusive from military sources, saying that the army plans to dissolve the Islamist dominated parliament and to suspend the constitution. That at the moment is a report, but that's certainly a plan that would, they might argue, give them some kind of a, of a breathing space uh, for what they want to do. I have to say that the Muslim Brotherhood would not go quietly if the, an attempt was made to remove them from power. At the rally I was just at, there were young men brandishing burial shrouds, martyrdom-minded young men, who I think were trying to show their willingness to die for the cause. A senior official on the stage was saying that God would be on their side, that God would protect them, and that they were the, the righteous people in all of this. So Egypt, deeply divided, very tense, highly agitated about what's going to happen in the next 24 hours. Okay, Jerry Byrne in Terry Square, thank you. Well, there's more information on the deepening crisis in Egypt on the BBC News website. That's at bbc.co.uk forward slash Egypt. Members of the Welsh Assembly are tonight expected to approve a system of presumed consent for organ donation. Once the vote is passed, it will mean that people have consented for their organs to be donated after death, unless they've specifically objected. With the details, here's our Wales correspondent, Howell Griffith. It's a gift that can change lives. In Britain, organ donation has always depended on card-carrying volunteers. But in 2015, every adult living in Wales could become a potential donor unless they actively choose to opt out. Tonight's vote would introduce the most controversial change in the Welsh Government's history. The legislation makes it absolutely clear that if you are not comfortable with being an organ donor, you have an absolute right in the simplest way possible to opt out of the system. It's a change that can't come quickly enough for Martin Griffiths. Born with heart and lung problems, he's on the transplant waiting list. There's no way to know if or when an organ will be found. The old days where get fed up, I can't be bothered. Don't want to go to dialysis. I just want to stay in bed and be left alone. There are currently over 10,000 people across the UK waiting for a transplant organ, but demand massively outweighs supply. Last year, there were just over 1,200 donors. Changing the law in Wales alone won't transform the numbers. Only 15 extra donors are expected per year. Those who work with transplant patients say having a public debate is every bit as important. At this transplant unit, they've already seen an increase in donations in recent years. The change in law won't only have an impact here. Organs donated in Wales don't just stay within its borders. They're matched with patients across the UK. That could benefit families like Oliver's. They live in Oswestry, on the English side of the border with Wales. Although his parents don't come under the new law, it could help Oliver have a heart transplant. If we don't get an organ for Oliver, Oliver will die. Um, and it's, 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 you know, it's black and white, it's life and death, which is tragic um, for those people that are going to lose their life. But if they are going to lose their life, then to, to give life to somebody else is just massive. But a similar change in England, Scotland and Northern Ireland seems unlikely. There have been vigorous campaigns against abandoning the traditional donor register. I think it's a scandal. It will result in human organs being treated like clapped out cars. As Assembly members vote this evening, they'll decide if Wales will follow its own path and make it potentially a nation of donors. Howell Griffith, BBC News, Cardiff. The government is to begin a public consultation on the use of controversial stop and search powers after expressing concern that they're a waste of police time. According to the Home Office, the police carried out 1.2 million searches last year, but those searches led to just 108,000 arrests, less than 10%. Our Home Affairs correspondent, Matt Proger, reports. A man is stopped and searched in the London borough of Lewisham today. This one resulted in a caution for possession of marijuana but too many end with no action at all. 
This is a hot spot. This is where a lot of stop and search go on. Police uh, advisor Ken Hines has bitter experience. He's been stopped and searched a hundred times, never resulting in a conviction. And it's happened to his nephew Jonathan six times this year alone. Three weeks ago, going to the shop stopped me and my cousin by seven police who were on the road doing searches, searched our pockets, made us feel very uncomfortable, found nothing on us, let us go, obviously, but it was a real humiliating experience. The government says police across England and Wales need to better target those they stop and search. I want to see stop and search used only when it's needed. I want to see higher search to arrest ratios. I want to see better community engagement. And I want to see more efficient recording practices across the country. Across England and Wales, police carry out more than a million stop and searches each year. Last year, only 9% of stop and searches actually resulted in an arrest. So here in Lewisham, they've been piloting a scheme where they use better intelligence to target those they stop and search. And they've managed to cut the number of stop and searches without adversely affecting the crime rate. The practice is one that divides people often, but not always, along the lines of race. Have you ever been stopped and searched by the police? Yeah. How many times? More than 10 times. And have you ever been arrested? Uh, no. It's necessary because of people, so many people carrying weapons these days. Have you ever been stopped and searched? No, obviously, because most it's mainly black people that get stopped and searched, really. And is, and is that justified? No, not at all. The pilot scheme in Lewisham has been extended to police officers at four other forces in England. Whilst they're, they're actually using that power to, to put their hand in somebody's pocket or search their bag on fewer occasions, they're actually getting much more successful at targeting the right people. If used well, stop and search is a powerful police tool. The government wants it used better. Matt Proger, BBC News. The troubled 111 urgent care helpline brought in to ease the pressure on A&E departments across England is facing more difficulties. The BBC has learnt that NHS Direct is to pull out of its contracts running the helpline in North Essex and Cornwall, saying they're not financially sustainable. Our health correspondent Dominic Hughes is in Manchester. Dominic, this sounds like more trouble for a helpline which has already had difficulties. Yes, well, Fiona, NHS 111 is meant to be a helpline for people seeking urgent but not emergency care. And so easing pressures on the accident and emergency departments in hospitals like this one. And in some areas, it is working very well, but it has, as you say, had a very troubled rollout. We know that patients were having to wait a very long time for their calls to be answered. Other patients abandoned those calls altogether and just came down to A&Es like this one thereby increasing the pressure on already busy departments. Now, we've learned today that NHS Direct, which is the biggest single provider of 111 services and runs 11 contracts in England, covering a third of the population, is giving up on two of those contracts before they've even been up and running. We also know that NHS Direct is now reviewing the rest of its nine contracts in conjunction with NHS England and may pull out of those nine contracts. That is not unfeasible, it was said to me. So the future of those NHS direct contracts is very much up in the air. Fiona. OK, Dominic Hughes in Salford. Thank you. As South Africa holds its breath while Nelson Mandela lies critically ill in hospital, a row between members of his family about where he should be buried has grown increasingly ugly. There are allegations of grave tampering and profiteering, and now criminal charges have been brought by part of the Mandela family against one of his grandsons. Our Africa correspondent, Andrew Harding, reports. Nelson Mandela was born in these hills and will be buried here too. But where exactly? He's always insisted his grave should be here in Kunu, the village he grew up in and where he retired to until his health crumbled. But now his grandson, Mandla, is causing profound tensions in an already fractious family. He recently exhumed the bodies of three of Nelson Mandela's children and moved them from Kunu to this nearby village, Mfezo. Mandla is now chief here. He's built this huge complex in honour of his grandfather and the suspicion is that he wants his grave here too in order to attract more tourists. But opposition is growing. It was totally wrong for Mandela Mandela to remove uh, bones from uh, Kunu to 
Umveso. Because according to our culture and tradition, you cannot just take a decision unilaterally. With Nelson Mandela in hospital, the rest of his family sent lawyers today to try to force Mandela to return the graves. Then the police opened a criminal case against him. Nelson Mandela's close relatives are modern and cosmopolitan, but across South Africa, and particularly in rural communities, old traditions and beliefs remain in force. And so this uncomfortable dispute about the Mandela graves is being taken extremely seriously by all concerned. Some worry that the row is affecting Nelson Mandela's own condition. It is believed that an elderly member of the family or any member of the family wouldn't have a smooth transition in their life to the afterlife if there was still some dispute or discord in the family. So you can see the urgency for the family? This is the fierce urgency of the moment cannot be overemphasized. Towards the end of a grand, dignified life, an unseemly quarrel over tradition, family and power. Andrew Harding, BBC News, South Africa. The time has just gone a quarter past six. Our top story this evening. <laughs> A third day of protests on the streets of Cairo as the army warns it will impose a solution tomorrow if the politicians fail to resolve the crisis. And still to come, he was freed after a public outcry. The SAS sniper now standing trial for a second time. Later on BBC London News, digging for shale gas, Boris Johnson wants it in London. But does fracking make sense here in the capital? and how tennis fans are being urged to help save one of the capital's oldest church spires in Wimbledon. More at 6.30. Colleagues of the 19 US firefighters killed by an enormous blaze in Arizona have held a memorial for the victims. The dead were all from the same crew. Only one of the teams survived. The fire has now consumed more than 8,000 acres and continues to burn out of control. Scores of families have been forced to flee. At least 200 buildings, most of them homes, have been destroyed. Across southwest America, temperatures are dangerously high, today reaching 52 degrees Celsius. From Arizona, David Shookman reports. A frantic rush to escape. We've just been given this mobile phone video. Yeah, this fire is absolutely out of control. It was filmed as the inferno closed in on Sunday. That's a house fire, that's a house fire. Pat Bernard, who got out just in time, showed me how he captured the moment his hometown was destroyed. The, the oh my entire God. town is on fire. It just spreads. Is, propane tank is still burning. At first, the blaze picked out a few individual houses. And then Pat turned his phone to reveal the nightmare of how much of Yarnell was engulfed by flame. And nothing could stop it. I got my family out and I watched house after house explode. We saw 40 cars and propane tanks explode, pop off, blow off, and cars, barbecues were exploding. And uh, we, we, my son and I stayed till dark and watched dozens of houses burn to the ground. A memorial service for the 19 firefighters caught by the blaze. It's a devastating loss. And just before he died, one victim, Andrew Ashcraft, sent his wife this picture, showing the team on their way towards the fire that was to claim their lives. It was out of the ordinary because he said, this is getting wild, and uh, People's Valley and Arnell are, are looking to burn. And that is, that is not uh, common language, because usually he gets a thrill from the fire, a thrill from being there and helping. And this was a different scenario. So why did this happen? Well, one cause is the jet stream passing far to the north of the United States. The result is high pressure causing record-breaking temperatures. Meanwhile, the southwest U.S. has warmed up since the 1950s. The fire season is two months longer than 30 years ago. And Arizona's population has gone up 25% in the past 10 years. More people living in tinderbox conditions. This is why the risk of fire is so great. There's just so much dead wood around and dried grass. All it takes is one lightning strike and this whole lot can go up. Add to that the wind, which just keeps changing direction. And there's a recipe for disaster. 
At the fire station where the 19 firefighters were based, tributes have been pouring in. Everyone here feels the loss. And because this community is surrounded by dry forest, they also understand the dangers. David Chuckman, BBC News in Arizona. Police in West Yorkshire have arrested a 26-year-old man on suspicion of stabbing a nine-year-old boy in a skate park yesterday. The same man is also being questioned over the murder of an elderly woman who's believed to be his grandmother. Well, let's talk to Ed Thomas, who joins us from Shipley. Ed, what more can you tell us? Fiona, it was the children who live here that campaigned for this skate park to be built. They said they wanted somewhere safe to play. But in just 24 hours in Shipley, a nine-year-old boy has been stabbed, a grandmother murdered, and now five men are being questioned by police. Instead of children playing, it's police forensic teams that have taken over Carnegie Park. This is now a crime scene after a nine-year-old boy was stabbed for no reason. It looked drip white. It looked fear. Eli Liu tried to help. He says some children here no longer want to play outside. They're petrified of going anywhere by themselves. Children? Yeah. They should be able to walk around the streets without anybody hassling them. Just minutes after the stabbing, an eight-year-old girl was chased through her garden and less than half a mile away. Police came here and found the body of Louisa Demby. The 84-year-old had been stabbed to death. It's now believed her grandson has been arrested on suspicion of her murder and stabbing the schoolboy. They just went whoosh. They were just in. They were no kids about. It's just sickening, isn't it? There's been a lot to take in for people who live here. She was lovely. She was always in a garden. You know, she wanted a, she just wanted a, a fly, a flying for it to happen. Today, police came to the skate park to try to reassure those who live here. We're not looking for anybody else in connection with any of the incidents and I can reassure the public um, to that end that there is no one um, outstanding for this matter. Yeah. Um, uh, Police offered the same reassurance to parents at the nine-year-old boys' school. He said to be recovering after surgery, but many here still want to know why he was attacked in a place he should have felt safe. Ed Thomas, BBC News, Shipley. The retrial of an SAS sniper who's accused of illegally possessing a gun and ammunition has begun at a military court in Wiltshire. Sergeant Danny Nightingale, who's pleaded not guilty, had his original conviction quashed at the Court of Appeal in March following a public campaign. Duncan Kennedy reports. To many people, he's an SAS hero who should be freed. But to the military, he's guilty of a serious crime. Sergeant Danny Nightingale said little as he arrived with his wife Sally today. In the military court, Sergeant Nightingale was accused of breaking all army and civilian laws by having an illegal gun and ammunition. The prosecutor, Timothy Cray, said there were no special exemptions for the SAS. Well, this is the type of gun at the centre of this case, a Glock 9mm pistol, although this one is a replica. Sergeant Nightingale's case is that the one given to him by Iraqi Special Forces came back on a different flight to the one he took, ended up in a kit bag that he completely forgot about. Sergeant Danny Nightingale has been an SAS sniper for 12 years. In 2007, he was presented with the Glock pistol by Iraqi Army colleagues. In 2009, he suffered brain damage running a marathon in the Amazon, which he says affected his memory of what happened to the gun. In 2011, he was arrested for being in possession of the pistol and ammunition. Last November, he was jailed for 18 months, provoking huge public anger. But in March this year, the conviction was quashed. At his home, he told me the pressures of the case had been enormous. It's brought the family together. It could have broken us, I think, but... We're lucky we've got a very strong family and it's helped, helped bring us together. His wife Sally said they'd also been overwhelmed by the public support they'd received. People feel that they owe a debt of gratitude to the armed forces, which, you know, has really come across strongly in all of this case, and they just don't see the sense in, in this at all. More than 100,000 people have now signed a petition in support of Sergeant Nightingale. Duncan Kennedy, BBC News, at Bulford Military Court. It's been another exciting day at Wimbledon. The women have been in action today in the quarterfinals. Despite the rain doing its best to interrupt play, watching courtside for us was Andy Swiss. Andy. <laughs> 